Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Jamie Hepburn. Do you ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the recent comments by the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions regarding further changes to welfare benefits and the impact that these changes would have on poverty in Scotland? Minister Margaret Burgess. On July the 1st this year, the Scottish Government published statistics that show the reduction in poverty in Scotland seen in recent years is now being reversed. One million people in Scotland are now living in relative poverty after housing costs, including more than 200,000 children. And this is simply unacceptable in a country as wealthy as Scotland. Separate analysis shows that Scotland could potentially see its welfare budget reduced by around £6 billion by 2015-16, and estimates suggest that up to 100,000 more children would be living in poverty by 2020 if we continue with Westminster policies. Taken together, these statistics suggest that the unacceptable increase in the number of children living in poverty revealed in our most recent statistics could just be the tip of the iceberg, and that is before the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions makes any further changes to the current benefit arrangements. Jamie Hepburn. I thank the Minister for that answer. In his speech last week, Duncan Smith said that his government sought to focus on independence, not dependence. Does the Minister agree with me that for more than 100,000 disabled Scots who stand to lose uh, about uh, £1,120 uh, uh, in their income due to Mr Duncan Smith's government's reforms, that will actually negatively impact on their independence? Minister? Yes, the figure is agreed and is set out in the recently published Scottish Government analysis paper, Financial Impacts of Welfare Reform in Disabled People in Scotland. This Scottish Government is doing all it can to mitigate against the harmful effects of Westminster welfare reforms, but unfortunately the majority of the cuts are still to come and will hit the vulnerable hard. With a yes vote on the 18th of September, we can do much, much more than mitigate. We can halt the rollout of universal credit and personal independence payment, end the work capability assessment and replace it with a system fit for purpose. And in an independent Scotland, we will ensure that those with long-term disabilities are treated with dignity and, reserve, and, and receive a decent level of support. Question two, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what methods of consultation it uses to gauge the views of cyclists regarding major trunk roadworks. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the views of cycling groups are sought through the development of our trunk road projects by correspondence, by cycling workshops, exhibitions as part of the scheme proposals, web-based materials and statutory materials published as both draft and made-order stages. Uh, I thank the Minister for that response. The Minister will be aware of some of the challenges that existed for cyclists regarding the upgrading of the Keswick Bridge um, and the frustrations they had regarding perhaps some expectations that were uh, built up. The Scottish Government rightly promotes active travel. W would the Minister agree to meet with me in the Highland Cycling Campaign to look at ways of more positive engagement in the future? Minister? Yes, I'm more than happy to do that. And just for the members' information, we have uh, been actively seeking to establish a non-motorised user forum in order to provide the opportunity for representatives of the group, which includes uh, possibly the groups which John Finney refers to, to provide them an opportunity to consider uh, relevant issues to the A9 dueling programme. But I'm more than happy to meet the member and the groups that he's mentioned. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware that 800 cyclists will be travelling on the 82 on the 12th of September through Fort William and onwards to Fort Augustus as part of the Deloitte Tour. The 82, as the Minister knows, is subject to major roadworks. The 82 partnership are concerned that normal traffic on the road will be brought to a standstill, and this is an unnecessary negative impact on the economy. Can the Minister raise this issue with Transport Scotland and Police Scotland and inject some common sense into this proposal by rerouting it? Minister. Well, of course, I will uh, raise the concerns. They've been raised with me already, um, and uh, I'm in discussion with Transport Scotland. This is the initiative of the organisers. They've come forward with this proposal, and what we seek to do in that circumstance is accommodate that as best we can. But uh, as uh, I've said to the member, we will happily look at any concerns which have been expressed about possible congestion. Thank you, Jamidi. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will confirm the latest total annual service charge payable by NHS Lothian to consort health care for the most recent financial year in relation to the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Minister Michael Matheson. The total annual service charge payable to consort health care in respect of Edinburgh Royal Infirmary for 2013-14 was £47 million. Jamidi. 
As an Edinburgh MSP, I welcome the stricter management of the contract at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, which is delivering annual savings of £1.3 million. But should Consort Healthcare not restore to the health service the resources for patient care which have been lost over the years in which this contract has operated and before these savings were identified, will the Minister now instruct NHS Lothian to carry out a full financial health check into the contract to identify what further resources are due to the hospital and the health service? Minister. Well, I can inform the member that NHS Lothian are currently in the process of procuring a, an expert review group uh, which will look at the contract in great detail. And part of that will be to conduct a health check into its performance, both current and retrospectively. Uh, this work is due to begin uh, shortly. I can also inform the Chamber, in addition to this, the new Private Finance Initiative and Public Private Partnership Specialist Support Team has been established within Health Facilities Scotland. They will be responsible for carrying out detailed commercial reviews of all NHS Scotland PFI contracts, including the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. Question four, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what uh, action it's taken to uh, strengthen and grow the economy. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. So, no, the Scottish economy is continuing to strengthen and grow. Scottish GDP grew by 2.6% in the year to quarter 1 2014 and has passed its pre recession peak. As the Chief Economist's recent assessment of the state of the economy points out, the underlying data and trends indicate that 2014 will be Scotland's strongest year of growth since 2007. Last week's labour market figures show that Scottish employment has increased further to the highest level on record. The Scottish Government is continuing to take action to support sustainable economic growth in Scotland. We are investing in infrastructure to support growth, helping uh, building a supportive business environment, investing in innovation and helping our young people obtain the skills they need to succeed in the labour market. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, I welcome the publication of the recent um, document, which is a, a, a jobs plan for the uh, independent Scotland, which is obviously looking at the long-term aspects of strengthening our economy and providing opportunities within the labour market. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that to, to take uh, full control of strengthening our economy for the future, we do need the full fiscal powers and tax revenue powers in an independent Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so we've, as my earlier answer to Dennis Robertson illustrated, we have taken a number of measures within our existing powers to deliver as much uh, impetus to the Scottish economy as we possibly can do. But of course there are decisions that are out with our control in relation to the economy and the opportunity of independence highlighted by the contents of the Jobs Plan for Scotland is there be a range of policy interventions that we could take which would strengthen and support the development of the Scottish economy um, and we could only undertake those uh, measures if we had the full range of powers that are on offer to, people, to the people of Scotland in the referendum on the 18th of September. Question five, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met Dumfries and Galloway Council and what matters were discussed. Minister, Derek Mackay. Ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including Dumfries and Galloway Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Alex Ferguson. Uh, great for the Minister for that response. Uh, he will be aware that the Council Tax Variation for Unoccupied Buildings Regulations 2013 gave local authorities the right to charge up to 200% Council tax on properties that have been empty for 12 months or more. He may not be aware that in Dumfries and Galloway that currently amounts to some 926 properties, many of which have been on the market for the entire duration of their vacancy. Indeed, 663 of them have been on the market for over 24 months. Could the Minister confirm that this provision within the legislation was not intended to penalise people who are genuinely unable to sell their homes in a stagnant market? And would he also confirm that the legislation gives local authorities the ability to include further categories where exceptional circumstances could allow an exemption to the 200%? The Minister. Uh, Mr Ferguson uh, characterises the intention of the Bill and the uh, regulations accurately, so I can confirm uh, the position on both questions that that was a fair assessment of what was intended, and it should not punish those who are genuinely trying to sell their property uh, within the market. So uh, that is a fair and accurate uh, question, and I will provide further support in writing if that would assist the member. Question number six, Kevin Stewart. 
Leading officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to recent reports that the North Sea could hold more than £40 billion worth of unforeseen oil reserves. Minister. Uh, presiding officer, recent reports illustrate the important role that innovation and new technological solutions can play in achieving significant cost savings for the industry, boosting production and ultimately increasing tax revenue from North Sea oil and gas extraction. With the powers of independence, the Scottish Government would be able to ensure that North Sea revenues are used to provide long-term benefit to the Scottish people instead of being squandered by Westminster governments, as in the past. We know that Scotland has vast untapped potential that could be unlocked by applying innovative production systems and world-leading technology. Kevin Shook. Uh, we all get very excited about new fields such as Bentley, Faro and uh, Clare Ridge. But opportunity also a, a exists in, in fields that are already in production. Does the Minister share my view that successful innovative solutions like enhanced oil recovery techniques are essential in order to maximise recovery and that adoption of such solutions will lead to increasing and maximising the tax yields for the people of Scotland? Minister. Well, yes, I do. That and fiscal stability and predictability, something that the industry has never had under the UK's stewardship of this matter. Presiding officer, as the Wood Review highlighted, Order. As, uh, Order. As, as Sir Ian, a hugely respected figure in the oil and gas industry, highlighted, implementing its recommendations could add £200 billion to the economy. And this included effective implementation of EOR, enhanced oil recovery, uh, which uh, could secure up to six billion barrels of oil in a best case scenario, something which I discussed at length with BP uh, earlier this week. And I also agree with Sir Ian Wood when he advised young people in 2012. He said, my headline message for the youth of today is get involved. The North Sea industry will see you through your lifetime. Louis MacDonald. Does the Minister acknowledge that even if all the changes are made which Sir Ian Wood recommends in his report on maximising economic recovery of oil and gas, even if all those changes are made, Sir Ian believes, and I quote, that the Scottish Government's central prediction of what's still to come is between 45% and 60% too high. Does the Minister accept or reject that view? Minister. Well, we, we have always recognised, as Serene Wood said, and he mentioned it six times in his report, that the amount of recoverable oil res, uh, and gas reserves could be between 12 and 24 billion barrels. It depends entirely, presiding officer, on whether the right policies are pursued or the wrong ones. And the truth is, and Sir Ian once again records this in his report, uh, that sadly the stewardship of the UK of oil and gas over 40 years has been characterised, and I quote, by fiscal instability and a lack of predictability. That is what we offer under independence. That is what has not happened under the UK. Michael Fraser. Uh, Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Listening to Mr Ewing's response, you would have thought Serene had come out to support independence, which of course he hasn't. But can the Minister tell us when did Sir Ian Wood go from being a much respected oil expert to being somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about? Minister. Well, I think Mr Fraser has been here for long enough to know that you should actually listen to the first answer. <laughs> This is not about personalities. Serene is a hugely respected figure across the world. And uh, just as we respect people on the other benches, we disagree with their prescription for the future of Scotland. Let me point out, uh, Presiding Officer, that just yesterday Serene has confirmed that with the right policies, he would expect that between 15 to 16 billion barrels should be recoverable over a relatively short period of a couple of decades. Uh, that compares with the OBR's actual prediction of 10 billion barrels. Sir Ian yesterday has simply confirmed once again, along with Sir Donald Mackay, 
and many other leading experts that the OBR's figures are between 50 and 60 per cent too low and therefore increasingly are looking utterly discredited. Question 7, Gil Patterson. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has taken it carried out on the impact of UK Government reductions in benefits on disabled people in Scotland. Minister Margaret Burden. Okay. The Scottish Government analysis published last week found that disabled people in Scotland are likely to experience disproportionate loss of income due to the cumulative effects of welfare reform. Spending on disability benefits in Scotland is expected to be around £310 million lower per year by 2018. The report also pointed to independent research from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research and Landman Economics. The authors, authors of this work concluded that due to UK government welfare reforms, households with a disabled child face average annual loss of income of around £1,400, while households with disabled adults and disabled children are expected to lose around £1,900 a year. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Following the Labour Party's absolute shameful refusal to commit to halting the implementation of personal independence payments last week, what impact does the Cabinet Secretary believe a yes vote would have? Margaret Burgess. Thank you. Well, the White Paper and our recent report on disabled people recognises that the rollout of personal independence payments will create hardship for many families with a disabled person in Scotland. Scotland's future sets out on page 158 a clear commitment to halt the further rollout of personal independent payment in Scotland, which would allow the first government of an independent Scotland to take forward reforms to the welfare system that meets Scotland's needs and reflects our priority. That commitment has not been matched by the Labour Party. So I absolutely agree that the only way to stop the, the rollout of this is by voting yes on the 18th of September. Question 8, Colin Keir. To ask the Scottish Government whether a review has been carried out and how effective the Queensferry Crossing consultation forums have been in dealing with local groups and people. Minister Keith Brown. Yes, uh, the effectiveness of the consultation forums is kept under regular review and also audited to ensure that proper and efficient communication is undertaken with local groups and people through the project's community communication and stakeholder liaison teams. Colin Keir. I thank the Minister for his answer. And to ask if contractors of the Queen's Ferry Crossing have improved communications to local residents, particularly in the Echlane area of South Queen's Ferry, in the light of complaints from those affected by the major civil engineering works and changes to work schedules, including extra work at weekends. Minister. The fourth crossing bridge constructors have been proactive in providing effective and sustained communications throughout the project, and that includes regular neighbourhood notifications for upcoming works, including the local residents in the Eklund area of South Queensferry. All project work must and has been carried out in accordance with the working hours permitted in the Code of Construction Practice, and any complaints received have been thoroughly investigated, and where necessary, the communication of information to residents has been improved. That's a hallmark of this scheme, and can I just refer the member to the editorial in today's Scotsman, which says that there can be little doubt that the Queen's Ferry Crossing has been remarkably free of financial, practical or contractual difficulties. It has been a public works project worth celebrating, and we intend that should also be true for the local community. Question 9, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the most recent labour market statistics from the Office for National Statistics. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, with a record number of people in work and the, employment rate, the unemployment rate at its lowest rate since early 2009, the latest labour market statistics show a clear and sustained strengthening in the Scottish economy. The fall in youth unemployment over the last year is also welcome. Briefly, Mr Allard. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that while independence is not a magic wand, with the policy levers available to us with a yes vote, like our transformational plans for childcare, we can get more people in Scotland into work or training? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, the, the Government has uh, ensured through the activities and policies that we have taken forward that the Scottish economy has been able to recover to pre-recession levels of activity earlier than the rest of the United Kingdom. What we want to do is to have the wider range of powers to ensure that we can cement that recovery and ensure that we deliver new and better opportunities for the people of Scotland with the exercise of the full responsibilities of an independent Scotland. Yeah, yeah.
Thank you. Before we come to First Minister's questions, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery the Right Honourable Richard Mzoya, Speaker of the National Assembly of Malawi. We now move to First Minister.